All right, let's talk about fertilization. Now, we've already talked about some of these things, but now we're going to get into more detail regarding how fertilization in these model organisms initiates gastrulation, cleavage and gastrulation in these embryos, as well as how even some of the earliest stages of fertilization or the fertilization itself leads to axis specification. Because in some of these organisms, where the sperm enters into predetermines the axis that, the, uh, that is going to develop from the ventral to the dorsal to the anterior to the posterior. So even at the earliest stages of fertilization, we're going to talk a little bit about axis specification in each one of these embryos. So well, I'm going to go through each model organism. We're going to talk about how fertilization and some of the key events of fertilization. Let's start with Xenopus. The way that the frog embryo is set up, or the oocyte is set up, the sperm can only enter in through the animal pole. It, it cannot penetrate the vegetal pole, um, or the, uh, um, where most of the, the high concentration of yolk is at. So it can enter into anywhere along the animal pole, any part in the animal hemisphere. Now, one of the key things that if you use Xenopus in talking about fertilization, I don't want you to just, just describe this, but cortical rotation, this is a huge thing in terms of axis specification as well as in the initial patterning of the embryo. Let's talk a little bit about cortical rotation. What happens is in the animal pole, the sperm will enter into any, any part of it. Now, where the sperm enters into predetermines the ventral region of the xenopus. So, 180 degrees or on the opposite side of where the sperm enters, that's the most dorsal region of the xenopus. So even axis specification is predetermined by where the sperm enters into. We'll get into the dynamics as we go through this lecture on how that occurs. Well, one of the first things that occurs is what we call cortical rotation. Now, at the most vegetal pole of the, or, uh, uh, of the xenopus oocyte, one of the maternal factors that is sequestered there is disheveled. Do you remember what, what signal transduction pathway disheveled plays a main role in? Wnt, Wnt signal transduction pathway. So disheveled is found here, but what happens is the outer region of the oocyte shifts exactly 30 degrees. I mean, that's amazing in and of itself, the exactness of it, but always 30 degrees, it'll shift the outer layer, which then pushes this disheveled, which is at the most vegetal pole, to one side. Now that region right there is going to be a key region later on in the gastrulation process of Xenopus. We haven't talked about the organizer yet, but just to give you a preemptive, that's where the organizer is going to form, is right there. So as far as fertilization goes, the sperm can enter anywhere into the animal pole, but where it enters into predetermines the vegetal, or not the vegetal, the ventral region of the um, xenopus. And the other side is going to be the dorsal region of the xenopus. I'll get into the dynamics later on of disheveled when we get into the organizer, but that is already, as we've mentioned, this is where you get asymmetric distribution of various maternal factors that are going to influence after cleavage occurs and a lot of the gastrulation movements. So let's talk about fish fertilization, xenopus. We've talked about the calcium waves that usually come about because of the um, uh, infertilization. These calcium waves uh, will help initialize some of the um, maternal components and allow the, uh, the genes to be translated into protein and then start the ball rolling. So these calcium waves are part of not only to prevent polyspermy, but they're also meant to initiate various um, processes within the cytoplasm. One of the processes that's important for fish is that the cytoskeleton will actually squeeze part of the non yolky area and create this little bubble, which we call blastodisc, on the animal pole. So this apical blastodisc is where cleavage is going to occur. Chick fertilization. So ultimately, chickens can lay eggs and not have them fertilized. 
Okay? They don't have to be fertilized for them to lay the eggs. When the chicken lays the egg, as it is traveling down the oviduct, the um, albumin becomes surrounded by a calcified shell, and then eventually the, uh, uh, the egg is laid. Well, fertilization has to occur internally um, before the shell is secreted to cover the egg. So you have the albumin, you have the yolk, and then you have the, the oocyte. Well, it needs to be fertilized, and then the shell gets secreted around that. In fact, as the egg starts traveling down the oviduct, forces of gravity will play a role in the patterning, in the anterior-posterior axis patterning of the embryo itself. So the mere gravity that will cause certain maternal components to be sequestered to one side uh, are critical in the anterior-posterior formation. The fertilization has to occur internally, similar to us, obviously, um, before the egg is laid. It doesn't occur after the fact. I'm surprised that not many people know this, but there it is. Okay, so mammalian fertilization. Here's some, there's some fascinating things about, uh, this, is, this includes uh, mice and rats and humans. It occurs in the oviduct. Now, one of the fascinating things about mammalian fertilization is when the female ovulates the oocyte, meiosis is halted at about metaphase two and it won't even finish until fertilization. So once fertilization occurs, then the last stages, anaphase two and telophase two, and then the removal of the polar body, which is the second nuclei uh, of the oocyte, does not occur until fertilization occurs. In fact, it won't, won't go past metaphase two unless fertilization occurs. So this is something different that you would find in mammals rather than in other organisms. And then cleavage begins as it's traveling down the oviduct. In fact, it has to be ready to be implanted into the uterus by the time it reaches the uterus. And so there's a lot of cleavage and gastrulation going on as it's traveling down the oviduct before it's able to be in implanted into the uterus. So that's fertilization. This is one of the easiest of the four. Okay? So I just explained some of the initial mechanisms. Now I'll explain more about fertilization later on and as it relates to these other topics as we, as we go through here. But here you can see after ovulation, the oocyte still is right in the middle of metaphase two, and then it will be fertilized. It will then finish meiosis two, eject one of the nuclei, which we call a polar body, and retain the last one and then those nuclei will fuse, and then it will start going through the processes of cleavage and gastrulation, and then eventually implantation into the uterus. Cleavage. Now, we've talked quite a bit about cleavage, so this will kind of be a recap of what we've already discussed, but there will also be some new things that we're talking about as well. You already know that the yolk in various organisms inhibit where cleavage occurs. In regards for the model organisms that we use, it affects three out of the four. In mammals, there really isn't any yolk. So the cleavage is holoblastic and completely divides all of the cells evenly. However, for frog, fish, and chickens, there are some fundamental differences that I need to reiterate and go over. In the xenopus, as well as in the um, zebrafish, the animal pole is the area that has the low yolk, and the vegetal pole has the area where there's the high yolk concentration. So let's look at the xenopus first. Its mode of cleavage is displaced radial holoblastic cleavage. Now, holoblastic, remember, means what? Higher cytoplasm. Everything undergoes cleavage. There isn't a part of the oocyte that's left out in the cleavage process. Displaced has to do with the fact that because of the different concentrations of yolk from the animal pole to the vegetal pole, then the um, blastomeres, or the cells that result from cleavage, are going to be smaller in the top and, and larger in the bottom. You're not going to get even division amongst the cells. The ones in the vegetal pole are going to be much larger than the ones in the animal pole because of the different concentrations of yolk, which is going to impede cleavage in the um, uh, most vegetal regions. In fact, the first few cleavages don't even complete before the next ones start as they're going down 
In fact, it creates these stress folds in the animal pole. So cleavage occurs kind of from the animal pole down to the vegetal pole in the first few cell divisions. And you can see how the first one's not even done and the second one begins. Now you do have mitotic divisions going on when you have multiple nuclei in these particular regions where the cells are going to be partitioned. But this, these stress folds are going to uh, happen all the way down here because as it's trying to pull uh, uh, the uh, membrane in and completely close off these, you can see that it's easy here in the animal pole. It's much harder in the vegetal pole. That'll create smaller blastomeres in the, in the uh, animal pole and much larger blastomeres in the vegetal pole due to that differences in the yolk concentration. So you can see that here as well. This region right here, this is what we call the gray crescent. Now, the reason why this is called the gray crescent is a frog embryo is really dark on the animal pole and much lighter in the vegetal pole. Well, what's one of the first things that happens after fertilization in the animal pole? Cortical rotation. So as the cortical rotation occurs, it actually creates this area, which we call the gray crescent, which is a little bit lighter in color. It's not going to be as dark as the animal pole because of that cortical rotation. This is going to be a key area because in this region right here is where most of the initial stages of gastrulation occur in the xenopus. This is a key area for organization of the frog embryo. But one of the key things you have to understand about the blastocele, as you'll see it in, in pretty much all of these organisms, in the not only the gastrulation processes where the cells are moving, but also in the specification process, if this blastocele is not there, the three germ layers will not form properly. There needs to be a separation, especially from these most animal pole cells or the most um, these cells right here, uh, from these cells, because there are paracrine factors and various interactions and, and morphogen gradients that are being established here that if you don't have this blastocele, this will not form into ectoderm and neural tissue. All right, zebrafish. It's discoidal, just like uh, xenopus, but it's meroblastic, which means what? Part of it. Meroblastic is just part of the embryo. So as we've talked about in the first parts of fertilization, the actin filaments will squeeze the animal pole, forming a blastodisc, and this is where cleavage is going to occur. It's going to start forming this mound of cells on the animal poles above the yolk. There will be nuclei that will be just beneath where cleavage is occurring, and we call this the yolk syncytial layer. Remember syncytial um, specification, where in just beneath this layer, in fact, the nuclei will eventually surround and still become this yolk syncytial layer. Um, there will be nuclei just underneath that are important in the development process. So here, this is the blastodisc. It undergoes discoidal meroblastic cleavage. In fact, in these first stages of cleavage, the underlying is, uh, uh, area, the cytoplasm here, is still in contact with the yolk. There are key factors that will come from gene transcription in the nuclei that are in this yolk syncytial layer. In fact, let me see if I can, oh, here it is. So here, eventually the cytoplasm of these cells will undergo cleavage and they will uh, um, close off. But initially, very similar to the Drosophila, where you have some morphogen gradients, these, this cytoplasm needs to remain open to allow some of these paracrine factors to help in the specification of these overlying cells. Eventually, all of these cells will close off, and then it will continue to undergo cleavage until you form this huge mass of cells, where the inner cell mass, very similar to you and I, uh, the inner cell mass, that will form the embryo, and the outer region, this will form a shield that is necessary for the envelopment of the yolk during the gastrulation process. But the main part here is this blastodisc, and this is where cleavage is occurring. It, it is exposed to the yolk syncytial layer during the initial stages. We'll talk more about that when we get into axis specification. Eventually, it closes off because it's received all of the paracrine signaling it needs from that yolk syncytial layer, and then the cells will start undergoing gastrulation. So those are the initial stages of cleavage. Here's another uh, picture just showing you. Here are the yolk syncytial nuclei here. 
here's the uh, uh, enveloping layer, the overall blastoderm, but it's only the deep cells or the inner cell mass or these deep cells are what become the embryo. The enveloping layer will form a shield around the yolk and play a role in development, but it won't actually become the embryo itself. Similar to the trophoblast in our, uh, in our development. Now chickens, they also have discoidal meroblastic cleavage, identical to zebrafish, in terms of how we call it discoidal meroblastic, but there are some fundamental differences. One of the things is that it doesn't form a bubble on top of the yolk, it just starts undergoing cleavage right at the top layer of the, of the yolk. So it does form a blastodisc, but it not like the xenopus where it squeezes it and forms this blastodisc. You're only going to start seeing, if you look top down, you can see that in the, top, uh, the topmost area of the yolk, you start getting cleavage occurring, and these cells will essentially just form one layer uh, on top of the yolk. So it's meroblastic because it's not going to encompass all of the yolk, and discoidal because you're getting you know, only a portion of these, and these cells are going to start um, forming the initial germ layers. Now, the, blast, or the um, blastocele forms just beneath here. In fact, these cells will cause uh, what we call a subgerminal cavity to form. These top cells will actually um, form a subgerminal cavity and then form another layer of cells beneath it, which will form the blastocele, which plays, again, a role in gastrulation and a lot of these movements going on. So what that does is it creates an area that is much lighter. When you look at it, it's much more clear. Uh, we call it the area pellucida. And the reason why it's much clearer is because water is between the yolk area and these cells that are forming, and therefore it's a little clearer to look through. The area just outside of that, where cells are also uh, uh, forming, is called the area opaca. And now if you think of opaque, it's kind of foggy or whatnot. That's because um, this is uh, flush with the yolk, and so there is no separation. So that's why this area is a little bit more clear, is because there is some fluid just beneath this top layer that gives it more of a translucent look. We call that the area pellucida. That's where the embryo, the main embryo, forms. There are going to be cells and other things that form out here in the area opaca, but those are mostly extra embryonic. They're not going to form the main embryo itself. So cleavage occurs just in a very restricted area in the area opaca, though there is other things going on in this other area called the area, uh, sorry, in the area pellucida is where the embryo forms, and then you have the area opaca where it's flush with the yolk. There's no subgerminal cavity. There's no blastocele that's forming just underneath these cells. So this will eventually form a second layer. The first layer of these cells is what we call the epiblast. So the epiblast is, that's what forms the embryo. That will actually form all three germ layers, is uh, these cells. The hypoblast, which is a group of cells that forms just beneath the epiblast, actually do not become the embryo, but they're necessary in the patterning of the embryo from the epiblast. So the hypoblast plays a key role in axis specification and in, in specification of certain cell types during the development, but eventually the hypoblast gets displaced by cells from the epiblast. So as far as understanding cleavage goes, the epiblast, which is that first top layer that forms on top of the yolk, is the embryo proper or the actual embryo itself. It's going to form all three germ layers. So the biggest mistake people make is thinking that the hypoblast forms the endoderm, and that is not the case. The hypoblast does not form the endoderm. If you look in the top side, you'll actually be able to see here in the area of pellucida, the cells start, uh, we'll talk about gastrulation here in a little bit, but the cells start migrating more uh, anteriorly, and then it starts forming the three body axes on this, on this region. Eventually, you get this region called the uh, primitive groove that forms the anterior to posterior axis of the embryo. And we'll get into some of these movements later when we talk about gastrulation. Mammalian cleavage. Holoblastic, isolithal. Iso means the same. So all of the 
blastomeres that are going to come from the cleavage processes are going to be the same size. There really is no animal and vegetal pole. There's no differences in the yolk. There's no yolk, really. Um, now, it's rotational because it doesn't divide the same way each time. In fact, it changes the plane in which uh, cleavage occurs. So it's not similar where you always have it along the same axis. Um, what you'll find is that in amphibians, you get perpendicular cleavage in this regard. Uh, but over here, or I'm sorry, you get them all along this, um, uh, this totally like having a brain fart right now. Anyway, you can see the different cleavage planes here versus here, where this starts becoming perpendicular to the initial cleavage plane. So this is what it means by rotational, is the actual cleavage plane rotates and changes in uh, these initial stages. Now, holoblastic, because it encompasses the entire oocyte, and you get cleavage pretty much right away. Now, one of the interesting things about mammals that doesn't occur in other organisms is after about eight cells form, you get what we call compaction. What compaction is, is unlike other organisms where you can actually see the individual blastomeres forming, after a certain point, the cells will increase these cadherins, or the cell adhesion molecules, and the cells will seem like one large lump. They'll actually become so tight that you can't tell the difference from one cell to another. So here, here's about the eight cell embryo, and this is where compaction occurs. See how they start fusing together almost? Now, they don't actually fuse together, but they start forming such tight junctions, but you can't really see some of the divisions between the cells. The main reason for this is because they start forming gap junctions for cell-to-cell -cell communication. They need some cell-to-cell -cell communication for these earliest stages uh, in this development process. So that's really what compaction is all about, is that the cells need to have a greater contact with one another. They increase the cadherins, these cell adhesion molecules, and they start forming a, a tighter mass. So you can see here in the mouse embryo, initially you can see a lot of the cells, and then compaction occurs and you can't see really the different cells anymore. They're there, but you really can't see a distinction between one cell and another. Eventually, the blastocele forms, just like in other organisms. The blastocele, again, plays a major role in gastrulation and in various movements. So this region right here, we call this the inner cell mass. This is what becomes you and I. So these cells right here are what become you and I. The outer cells we call the trophoblasts. These form the extra embryonic tissues, such as the placenta and the umbilical cord. So these are things that are necessary for development, for the implantation into the uterus and things of that sort. However, these cells right here are what become you and I. When you have monozygotic twins, this mass will split at, at an early enough stage that the two masses then become two completely separate organisms. Now, on occasion, they may not split, split completely, and you'll get twins that are conjoined and things of that sort. If they do split, there are a number of ways where they can share the same amniotic sac. Sometimes they don't share the same amniotic sac. You know, there's a number of things that can happen after that inner cell mass splits. Um, they can share one placenta. They can each have their own placenta. So there's a, a variety of different combinations. But the long and the short of it is monozygotic twins have the same genetics because they arose from a splitting of that inner cell mass, which is just mitosis. So they have the exact same genetics initially. But there's a lot of environmental factors that change their features as well. Even uh, monozygotic twins don't have the same fingerprint.